Hello, everybody. Um, we are really glad that you are here at today's webinar on Making Extension and Outreach Trainings Gender Sensitive, Part 2. Um, we hope you can hear us right, and good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're at. Um, just to give you a quick um, introduction, this is hosted by the Appropriate Scale Mechanization Consortium, ASMC, and the Integrating Gender and Nutrition within Extension Services Ingenious Project at the University of Illinois. Today, we are going to have part two of the webinar series, um, which started last week. Part one was about basics of effective training. Um, today, we're going to talk more about how to train the right people. And the next webinar on May 25th will be on great facilitation skills. Um, thank you again for joining us. Um, we will shortly begin right in just a moment. Okay. Hello again. Um, sorry, we had some technical difficulties, but we just managed to sort them out. Um, or not, apparently. <laughs>
Hello, everybody. Thank you for your patience as you waited for us to sort out some technical difficulties. We are back on track. Um, I just wanted to quickly remind that this is a three-part webinar series, and we are in part two today on how to train the right people. Um, to, uh, I just wanted to give a quick uh, recap from webinar one. Uh, we Last week, we went into why is being gender sensitive important? Why does it matter to you? And how can you be more gender sensitive in your training events? Um, and again, we specifically focused on basics of effective training. We looked at making gender responsive events fun, creating leadership decision-making opportunities, treating women as well as men as teachers and innovators, walking your talk. We also went to the next tip sheet on great content on collecting information to make your training relevant promote technologies and practices as menus, and promoting adaptive capacity. Uh, just a quick note that we do have, we are sharing the recording as well as a presentation from last time, so just in case you missed it, not to worry, we will resend it today again. Today, we will specifically be focusing on three tips, which is how do you have great training approaches, how to get the right people to come, and making sure that the right people can come. All right, a quick poll time. Have you facilitated a training event in the past? If you have facilitated a training event in the past, um, can you just quickly respond in your Zoom chat box saying yes or no? Great, I already see some people responding. Shahana has mentioned yes, she's facilitated a number of trainings on tra training of trainers with farmers. Sir Carlos mentioned yes. Um, Sir Carlos also specifically mentioned about training to farmers on commercial tomato production last November. Caroline has mentioned no. We're just going to wait a couple more seconds. Um, please let us know if you facilitated a training event. Um, we've also had another no from Niroj. And they're just responding to panelists. So. Um, and just a note, as you are responding on your chat, you can mention to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see your responses. Thank you. So we have a couple of yeses of people who've done pretty complex trainings and some no, so we are on equal footing here. So um, here's another question. Have you utilized or experienced innovative training approaches in your training events? So if you have conducted training events, have you utilized an innovative training um, approach? Or if you've experienced a great training, have you experienced innovative training approach? Just take a couple seconds to type out um, what you may have utilized or experienced. <clears throat> So we're having a couple of um, comments coming in. Uh, both Andrea and Axon have mentioned about liberating structures. We have a response from Sir Carl saying he tried to make farmers use waste solution for a viral disease management in tomato plants. We'll just wait for a couple more seconds before we move on. All right, so I just wanted to pass 
on the um, to the next speaker, Andrea Bone, the Associate Director of the Ingenious Project, who will now lead us into great training approaches. Hi, everybody. So as usual, we start with a slide that gives an overview of what the next few ones are about. So the basic principles of great training are that the training methodology is right for the participants. Um, you know what, it's not ultimately about what you like, but about what you think the participants will like. So as we discussed last week, make sure you know a lot about your participants before you pick your methodology. Mind your language. Create a respectful atmosphere. Promote flat learning and knowledge sharing structures and foster positive interactions. And use ICTs, film and media. So now we'll go through them one by one. This slide should look familiar to everybody who was on the webinar last week. And, um, you know, there's two very, very different types of approaches. If you could put approaches into two boxes. One is more top down, where you're trying to persuade farmers or other people in your training to, uh, to do something. You've decided what the agenda is about and you're pushing uh, what they're supposed to learn. And the education model is more bottom up, where you give your farmers or trainees a lot more say in um, what the training is about. You involve them more. It's, um, it's more responsive to what the learning needs and interests of the participants are. You know, most of us had a school experience where, had, where we had a teacher stand in front of us and uh, talk for a very long time with us taking notes. <laughs> and uh, that is actually, it works for some people, but it doesn't work for a lot of people. Most people learn much better, um, and especially the older you are, if you have a chance to really be involved, you know, it's, it's using your hands, um, using your feet, being involved, being active, speaking with others rather than having to listen all the time. Uh, practical hands-on demonstrations in an environment that is very familiar to your trainees is usually very, very effective. Uh, let people practice what you've explained to them. I, I wish we were sitting together in a room right now and Sarkal could talk a little bit more about how he made them use the technique of the way solution. So um, I wonder, did Sarkal, did you just show them how to do the way solution or did they, the trainees themselves make that solution and practice using it uh, to manage the viral disease in tomato? Encourage a lot of experimentation, learning by doing, practicing. Use visual elements, and we'll, we'll have a whole slide just devoted to that. You know, uh, if you couldn't go just oh, back sorry. one. Um, in reflecting on this, you know, I've, I've sort of come a long way. I've come from a tradition of teaching where I have a big slide deck with lots of information that I want to share with people. It's all about uh, quantity of what I want to convey in my classes. And um, I've really come away from that. And... Um, focusing on maybe learning fewer things, but really learning them well. Uh, I think what's holding people back from more participatory approaches is that they feel that they can't cover all the content. But the problem is if you're sitting in the driver's seat and doing a, a top-down training where you're focusing on teaching as much as possible in a short time frame, you don't realize that people actually don't take a lot with them. Um, the learning is not as deep. And so while you may have covered a lot of ground, what people are able to do at the end of your training may be a lot less than if you've taken an approach that is much more hands-on, much more active learning, but they really, really get it and they, they learn a lot more in the end. Uh, there's lots of tips out there. If you are teaching a certain domain and you're preparing for your training, be sure to do some research into materials that others have used. Um, uh, and really check, are they using participatory methods in, um, in their training manuals? Uh, what visual uh, appeal are they doing? What kind of language are they using? So speaking of language, um, you know, it seems like a no-brainer, but 
do the training in the language that people are really comfortable with. Um, and all too often, we assume that the people we work with speak the same language or speak the language the same way that we are used to. Um, if, if at all possible, rather than working through a translator, have a trainer that actually speaks the local dialect. And another aspect of language isn't just, you know, is it English versus French or, you know, a local dialect. It's also about the kind of vocabulary we use in it. Um, sometimes, inadvertently, we're really creating a big distance to our trainees by using language that's much too complicated or that's much too uh, divisive that talks about us versus them, uh, the experts versus the farmers. And really, the farmers are experts in their own rights, and their trainees already bring a lot to the plate. Uh, let's not remove ourselves so much in our language from the people whom we're working with. The last point about checking for gender and other stereotypes and assumptions in your training materials um, leads to a piece of advice, and namely, run your material by somebody who's not seen it before, somebody who can really check your language for those stereotypes and assumptions. And I'd like to repeat a tip I gave last week, and that is um, have somebody film the whole training event and then take time together to, to look over what kind of language did I use? Did I create connections with my learners or was it distance? What kind of stereotypes did I use or did others use in the training? It's when you're in it, when you're facilitating and all of you have done this before, you're, you're so involved and you're so um, engaged in what you're doing, you may not realize that you're falling into those traps of gender stereotypes and, and making assumptions about um, the people you're working with. Sometimes it can get pretty heated in a training event. And in some ways that's a really good sign because it means people are, are really engaged with your content. Uh, look at the hand movements there and, and the eye movements of the people talking with each other at this event. They're having an intense dialogue. Wow, that's fantastic. But one of your jobs as a facilitator is make sure that this all happens in a respectful atmosphere. Uh, debate is good and having different opinions is good. But um, in this day and age, it's become very apparent that we really need to work harder at staying respectful towards each other. We can differ on, um, on how to solve a certain problem or how to interpret certain data, but we must uh, respect the other person for whom they are, what they believe, what they stand for, and not become offensive in our language or boss people around or dismiss their opinions. You don't have to agree with everything, and the, the trainees don't have to agree among themselves about everything, but they have to agree to respect each other. So we really want to create a safe space. If people feel like they're being dismissed or rejected or ridiculed, it's not a safe and welcoming place for them. So it's great to have fun, but as we mentioned last week, there, there can be a fine line between having fun and making fun of somebody. And also to make sure that um, whatever is talked about in, in the workshop is not repeated outside. I mean, you can talk about what you learn, but you may have heard some personal information or you may have observed some unf unflattering behavior. So, um, you know, try to keep these things confidential. So respect and confidentiality is something to keep in mind throughout your event. So how do you create positive interactions? One is working in smaller groups. It's very easy for individuals to get lost in a big room um, and they don't have a chance to really listen and really share. So use facilitation techniques that um, allow, that really promote people working in small groups. Role play is not only fun, but it's also a great way to talk about uh, sensitive topics and sort of bring them to the surface and uh, create flat power structures. Um, consider having people who are of similar standing, let's say in, in terms of 
the kind of jobs that they have rather than having bosses uh, work with uh, their staff, if possible. It's not always possible. But people are afraid to speak up if somebody is in the group who has a lot of power over them. So here's just some nice images of such positive interactions and people having fun. And here you really see how speak, people are speaking with each other. And I'm sure everybody who has been a trainee or trained uh, really loves those moments when, when you see people attentively listening to each other. And just briefly, uh, again, we also talked about it last week, the power of photos and videos and radio um, as, as an, a rich way to, um, to support hands-on learning activities. The important thing, if I have one tip to give you in terms of using photos and radio and, and video, is not to just uh, show it in isolation and sort of hope for people to figure out what you're trying to say, but try to have listening groups around radio shows, lead a discussion in conjunction with showing a video. And when you're showing photos, be sure to also really uh, talk about what the, the photo is trying to say, because it's very, very easy to make the assumption that people gain a certain understanding from those media and they may or may not. And it really deepens the learning to talk about it instead of just seeing it. So at the beginning, I said, you know, um, have somebody review your material. Uh, take a video of the training itself so that later on you can, you can critically reflect on the kind of behavior that, um, that happened in the training session. And this tip really relates to it as well. Don't just assume you've done a great job or a terrible job, but really encourage reflection um, the participants by themselves and to note that down on an evaluation form, but also to encourage um, a reflection where you have two, three people talking about what they learned um, at an event together. We've already mentioned the ORID reflection technique and that was in your reference package we sent out last week. And since we're talking about making training events gender more gender sensitive, it's really helpful if you can uh, collect information, maybe not by name, who, who wrote what, but you should know whether it was a woman or a man, um, an elder or a younger person, uh, a boss or coworker responding, so you can disaggregate and, and see if you see certain patterns emerging. So in summary, the tips we talked about, Make sure that you've got a training methodology that's that's right for the participants. Something that's great for you know older people might not be the right thing for a young crowd that wants to be entertained in a different way. Mind your language, create a respectful atmosphere, and you know maintain confidentiality. Promote flat learning and knowledge sharing structures. Always foster positive interactions, and do utilize uh, modern media to support the learning. Thanks, Andrea. That was great. Um, just moving on from what Andrea was mentioning about having a disaggregated um, feedback session from men versus women, I wanted to ask um, the participants here, do you tend to have a certain number of women versus men participant ratio in your training events? Um, do you set uh, a number saying you would like to have 50% women, 50% men, maybe 40% women, 60% men, if you do, just type your responses in the chat box. And I'm also seeing a lot of um, conversations going on in the chat box. That's fantastic. Uh, yes, please do share the um, information that you have. I'm not sure how to share a picture circle, um, but we, I'm sure we'll find out soon and let you know. Meanwhile, I'm going to pass it on to Tim Randall, who's the project manager for ASMC, who will go into our next tip um, right now. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. But before I go into my portion of the, the talk, I just wanted to address a question from Sarkal. Uh, yes, 
There will be certificates of completion for any participants who attended all three sessions. So I just wanted to give you that answer. I'm sorry I couldn't type into the chat box yet, um, but I wanted to let you know that yes, that will be available. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today and all of you who joined us on last week as well. And I hope that you will join us this upcoming Friday for part three of the series. Um, so my, my portion of the section is getting the right people to come. Um, setting targets for women participation, and we'll talk about what that means. Uh, getting technology users and decision makers within the trainings and using the training event as a change mechanism. Um, I see Shahana's answered the questions um, from, the, from the poll. Uh, good representation from as many women as possible. Oh, and Caroline um, mentions our trainings are open to everyone, but encourage women to attend. Um, and most of the time, women tends to be more than men. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so setting targets for women participation, what does this mean? Um, targeting is not just about getting a specific number of women in a training. It, it's more than that. It's really getting them engaged and participating in a training so they're able to benefit from the training the same as any other person that's attending that day. Um, so understand gender-related constraints that would limit their participation or the type of support that they require um, this means women only training events might be best if there are some issues where um, maybe let's say men are always the ones that are first to try and, and experiment and then women don't get a, an opportunity as a, as a facilitator that's something we should be looking at and say no we need to make sure that everybody's getting an opportunity to participate to practice to see this new technique and work with it um, Set targets of at least 30% women's participation. Uh, the national governments may set minimum quotas, but that should just be taken as a starting point. We should be looking to go further than what the national government says um, and look to ensure 50-50 participation between male youth and female youth. Um, if we're starting to expect this participation in trainings, that, that will start to create a cultural expectation of when participants do come to trainings there should be this nice collection of male, female, youth, all in the training, all learning together. Um, and, and it can be replicated in, in new events and, and keep going. I see Ashley says, we don't have a set ratio, but we aim for as many as possible. Um, and they, they typically have difficulty getting women into trainings. And, and one way we might be able to address that is, is to determine why they're having difficulty to get women into training and, and what that really is that barrier. And once they determine the barrier, we can look at, okay, well, it, it's difficult to have men and women in the same training at the same time. Sometimes that might be the case and, and a women only training event might be best, or it might be in the way we're, we're inviting or creating an invitation to join the training. We need to be very deliberate in how we frame that invitation to explain that we do need women and men, um, but it, it's something where we just need to be cognizant of, of the situation and see how we can address that. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, this, this is part of a larger training that was done in, in Burkina Faso and we targeted breakout sessions by gender. So at different points during the training, what, what we would do is we'd, we'd break by gender and allow the women to have an opportunity to, to be with themselves with, with a female facilitator and, and discuss in, in a different context than maybe the whole training where it was men and women um, and really give them their space to be in a situation where they're, they're completely comfortable. Maybe some of the barriers of the gender dynamic are, are lowered and they're able to openly communicate with each other. And once you'll see that, that empowers them even when they come back to the full male meeting uh, when it's males and females and the, the interaction will be greater and, and more of the issues around that will start to come to the surface and it will be a much more enriching experience. Um, and it, it's, ex, it's important to realize the difference between uh, types of women. Um, it could be women in male-headed households and, and 
how do we link these women's participation in training events to the wider goals of the whole family? So this goes back to the invitation. How do we make sure that as we are inviting a family to join a training, we need to explain to the male headed household, we need the family there and we want this training event to be towards the goals of the family. Um, so that goes back to framing the development of these skills gained in, in the training to the broader goals of the family. Um, you know, considering the health, nutrition, ed education aspects of empowering women's knowledge and skills and, and the benefits it will have for the whole family and the whole community once, once these skills are learned by more family members than maybe just the, the patriarch or the head of household. Um, so in, the, in this situation with the women and male-headed headed households, we need to ensure that direct links between the women's contributions and entitlements are, are made. Um, start to build these associations between a woman's improved capacity to contribute to the household economy, um, contribute to business decisions, income growth, um, build their equity within, within the dynamic of the household. Um, uh, build women's rights to secure benefits in terms of more equitable food distribution and, and voice and expenditure decisions. So we're really looking at this as a household decision and, and the husband and wives are working together for the good of the household. Um, and it's essential that the dreams and aspirations of the women themselves are included. So even if they're included in the decision making, but really it's they're not included in the decision making, it, they're just agreeing with what they think is right, but they're not really putting their own thoughts, dreams, and aspirations into the decision making. Well, maybe there's still some way to go in terms of creating this equitable exchange between the male and female. Um, but it's important that we, we realize this and that we can, can start to take steps to um, approach this, this issue or, or develop solutions. Um, the other situation are women-headed households. So this is a bit different where the um, maybe a matriarch household and uh, there, there are different constraints for this type of household. Um, women of these households generally struggle with lack of adult, often male labor, um, weak access to productive resources, poor social capital, lack of time, so special effort does need to be made to reach and support these women's in such training events and make sure the content is relevant to them. So they, they already have so much on their plate and have so much to do. They need to make sure there's value for them to spend half a day, a few hours with you for your training session. Um, so in terms of working with initiatives to develop productive resources for women headed households, um, it's necessary if they are to implement, implement new technologies effectively that the training needs to be adapted and, and ready for them um, and the content needs to be relevant for them. When such women become empowered, they become role models for the entire community because everybody sees that it's, women are able to negotiate decisions, to have the same access with men, um, be able to be just as successful um, on their own, ha have similar crop yields, anything that they need to do that they're able to show and be a role model for the rest of the community that this is a vision of success and I'm able to be successful despite being a woman headed household. Um, next step is getting technology users and decision makers in the trainings. Um, so I, we can all imagine a situation where we're, we're giving a training on a technology or, or a farming practice that is typically completed by the, the women in the community. However, the training is full of men. Is this really an effective way to train? Um, you know, the heads of the households are invited to the training, but the person who's actually doing that, uh, using that technology or completing that task in the, in the field is not with us in the training. So how do we ensure that both the head of the households and their spouses can participate in the training? Um, and how do we ensure that women's heads of households are invited to facilitate and to participate actively, particularly with some of these constraints that they have that maybe some of the other heads of households won't have? Um, here's an example uh, in the picture in the top right of a post-harvest loss training in Burkina Faso. Um, so post-harvest loss is, a, is generally a task completed by the females um, 
or post-harvest techniques or activities, I should say, excuse me, are generally completed by the female. So we had a post-harvest loss training on different technologies and practices that you can implement to reduce post-harvest loss. And we made sure that the, the family was there, as the, as the husband and the wives, and they were learning together on, on different techniques to make sure that they were learning and can implement together. Um, using these training events as a change mechanism. So this, these training events can be an opportunity to adjust the gender and social inequalities in the communities. So if you have a training event for more than one day, you can ask your participants to reflect on some of these inequalities and, and what that means for, for their family and ask them to share their reflections the next day. You know, starting a dialogue around these inequalities within these trainings can be a very powerful tool for change. Um, and, and I see Shahan has just commented from, a, from the previous slide, yes, it happens many times that men are trained, but the, the work is of women, um, especially in farm mechanization. And then the training has no use. And, and, and I agree, Shahan, and that's on the facilitators to help understand that issue and, and create a training that, that approaches at a more sensitive level and, and being gender sensitive in our trainings. Um, so, so moving back to training events as a change mechanism, um, identify the needs and engage with socially marginalized women and men for technology. Um, this goes back to maybe a lot of the themes throughout our last two webinars is really understanding why people are socially marginalized and how we can effectively train despite this barrier. Um, meet participants or call participants prior to the training and encourage them to come. Um, making sure that the invitation is framed to show that it really is the husband and wife invited and we do want both to participate. Um, visiting the marginalized person homes to see how they're implementing the technologies and give on the spot advice. Um, being able to follow up and see um, if, the, if they're taking what they learned and, and if they're not, how we can say, well, maybe this is how you need to be looking at this um, and providing that continuous um, feedback and support. So I, that takes me through my slides and I'm going, to, oh, well, well, I need to summarize my slides. I apologize. So uh, to summarize my slides, when we're looking to get the right people to come, we need to make sure we're setting targets for women participation. Um, and those targets aren't just about getting them in the training. It's about getting them engaged and participating in the training so they are able to learn and take what they learned that day and apply it in the field. Um, getting the right people to come, also make sure you're getting the end user, the, the person that is doing it in the field or the person that has that decision making in the household to attend the training. So you make sure that it is effective in getting the, the information and the skills and knowledge to the person who needs to use them. Um, and the final, final thing about getting the right people to come is, is really to focus on using this event as a change mechanism. Start to question maybe some of the cultural norms that do present barriers for gender equity and ask the participants to reflect on that. And you can start to create a dialogue that creates a change. So, so um, we have one more question before we'll pass it on to Axon. And the question is, what methods have you used to ensure people can attend your training events? Um, I'll ask you to write this into the chat box. As it says, please respond in the chat box. And, and then I'll pass it on to our, our next speaker, uh, Axon. Um, I see Sakarl mentioned social medias are being used actually to ensure people can attend your trainings. That's excellent. We actually, we highlighted this webinar series on social media and is a way to promote our, our webinar. And it's, it's great to see that it's being utilized for trainings in the field as well. Um, I think it's a very powerful tool to make sure that farmers and others are able to attend their training. 
And it just shows how fast technology is being adopted in terms of ICT and cell phones and telecommunications. Axon mentioned direct text messaging and phone calls uh, as a great way to ensure participation um, and attendance in your training events. So I, th I think we'll move on to our next next section. Okay, Ashley Jungling, uh, one more. Um, in Mozambique, we set up an environment where women can bring their baby or young child to the training. Oh, that's a great point. Um, that's understanding a barrier of why women aren't able to attend the training in the sense that they, they have their families to take care of, they have time commitments, and there's no place for their children within the, the training. So if you have an environment with child care or the the ability for them to take care of their children while being trained, that really starts to break down a barrier of attendance. And Shauna makes a great comment. Um, your, your method of ensuring who can at attend will differ depending on whom you're targeting. So maybe a more um, high level uh, training, you might use email or um, professional communication. Whereas when you're working maybe with then the communities, flyers, phone calls, others can be, be effective. Okay. Okay, now, now Axon will start his portion of the presentation um, entitled Making Sure the Right People Can Come. Uh, thank you so much, Tim, uh, for that uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, in looking at uh, how we're going to make sure that the right people can come to the training, basically there are about two issues that we need to look at. One being the timing. We have to get uh, the timing right, as well as to get the budget right. What do we mean by getting the uh, timing as well as the budget right? On the timing aspect, we'll first look at an example that, uh, of the case story that was taken uh, from Zambia. In the Zambian context, we'll look at three things that are being done among many other things. The first one is the farmer field schools, then we look at the field days and the agricultural and commercial shows. So the farmer field schools, these are conducted throughout uh, the season uh, at every stage of production of the uh, particular crop variety. So when farmers are about to plant, the demo field will be arranged and people will be invited to the demo field to participate in the undertaking. And so this is uh, organized relevant uh, to the, what the farmers are going to work on in that particular season so that they can either immediately take it up the initiative or uh, take it up in the subsequent uh, following seasons. Then under the, far, the field days, these are a one-day event that is organized just before you harvest, when the uh, crop has matured in the field. The people will be invited in, um, in the lead farmers' uh, field to look at uh, what the farmer had done. And then every one of them gets to appreciate uh, whatever would have been done in that uh, field. And so this is done at the end when the farmers are less busy with their own on-farm operations. And uh, the agricultural and commercial shows, these are exhibition shows which are organized at the already a predetermined uh, period from about May to August. And these run throughout the entire country in various districts, uh, camps, blocks. And these are organized after the farmers have already harvested their crops. All these events are targeted at getting the time when the farmers are not busy with their own operations, or if they are busy with their operations, whatever interventions you are undertaking should be relevant to what the farmers are working on. That's what will stimulate them to come for those activities, and that's what we encourage them to come for those activities. In the case of the agriculture and commercial shows, these are also marketing opportunities and creating linkages to various uh, stakeholders in the agricultural sector. And so these are events that are relevant that we've uh, picked uh, from the Zambian context. Um, this, is, uh, the, this picture just shows um, a field day example in the rural part of the, uh, Zambia. This is a farmer explaining to the farmers that have been invited as well as the officers that have been invited just after the crop has matured before harvest. And what, what you can see is under these operations, when they send out invitations, invitations are sent out to couples, uh, to families. And so husbands and wives will come up with their wives. But no matter what happens, in most cases, the farmers, if, from this picture, you're able to see that the women are cuddled together. They are like in one place. 
when they come for these events, it's difficult to have the man and wife be together in one place. Usually women will, side, will be on the side and men will be on another side. And what we're trying to do by so doing is to encourage the people to be able to encourage our participation of both the male and female folk of the household. I'm moving on. In uh, getting the right timing, we have to make sure the, that we consider the seasonality with respect to both men and women's work. Sometimes we are organizing events when, other, when one sex is quite busy. Uh, what had happened in our case in the Zambian context was, uh, on one occasion, we had organized a training event, which was held very early in the morning, around 8 a.m. And around 8 a.m., we noticed that most women are busy with some household chores. And so as a result, even the attendance was affected. And so what happens is you move the event to a time when people are both male and female are able to come, say, around mid-morning or in the afternoon. But of course, with the consultations with the general uh, farmers or the target group that we're trying to look to train. Then you communicate with the participants at the best times and the best venues for you to get the maximum attendance. Then you keep the cost short. The training should be short in such a way that people should not feel like you are, you are taking the whole of the activities for the day and they just have to concentrate on the training that you have organized. But 30 minutes to about an hour event would suffice, maybe even two hours. But in an event that you are keeping people over lunch, that's when now you have to consider the aspect of uh, uh, what uh, say snacks will you provide or what food items will be provided as a way of encouraging people not to, to feel like they are living a certain aspect of their daily lives unattended to. And um, we're now going to look at uh, how do we get the budget right. In getting the budget right, because we had said uh, when we have to make sure the right people come, we look at the great timing and we look at the great budget. An example is also taken from the Zambian context where one of the activities that we had, the field days, the field days, we did a cost sharing as a way of promoting our ownership of uh, the uh, undertaking or the field day itself. This cost sharing can be either in um, financial uh, uh, support or in other resource material support that can be provided, where the farmer can provide, uh, say, he will provide the utensils that you need or provide the labor to uh, cook or the provide it's time for him to mobilize the other farmers and cook. And this has to be communicated with the farmers, as well as planning the consultations with the host farmer, where when you're looking at the estimates of the actual budget, if you are going to have a, a, a detailed budget on uh, buying food items or detailed budget on uh, mobilization of the groups or detailed budget of supplies and other things that might be needed for the training. These are issues that you have to do, look at in consultation with the farmers and the few part and parcel of the decision that will be made, and they'll support that undertaking that you're going to have. And um, in looking at uh, the budget, right, these are issues where we look at uh, the location. You need to choose a central place which will be easily accessible to both male and female. In most cases, we choose a venue that is uh, suitable to one sex. For example, if we choose a venue that is suitable to male, it's not all the time that a female will be also able to access that venue. But in most cases, when you target the female uh, sex to circle, we choose a venue that is accessible to females. Most cases, that venue also be uh, applicable or suitable for the male folk. And so most of the times we have to concentrate on the female needs because once we meet the female needs, we are almost certain that the male needs will be met as well. Then uh, in other cases, in other situations, we have to look at child care when you need uh, uh, breastfeeding mothers to come. In most societies, it's not a problem, but in other societies, maybe women might not be allowed to breastfeed in public, and so they might feel uncomfortable. It has to be encouraged that all are invited and all these issues are taken care of, or you might have a separate place where people will be allowed to have their children, uh, children's needs met. Sanitation facilities. Well, in most developing countries, men would easily, if especially in rural areas, men would easily use uh, the bush as a source of, uh, of uh, attending to their uh, sanitation needs or, and the like. But you find that in most cases, some of these issues might not be considered and we might disadvantage the female folk and they might feel uncomfortable to attend such events where their sanitation facilities are not met. Then the other time is food items. We need to provide light refreshments uh, like water to encourage, to encourage people to, to, to participate as well as to 
I get involved in the undertaking that you, are, you have organized. So in getting the budget right, we are not only looking at the budget in terms of monetary aspect of it, no, but looking at the whole logistical aspects of the training that we've organized have to be taken care of. Moving on. Um, in, summar in summarizing may how we make sure that the right people can come for our trainings, we need to have the timing right. In the timing has to be in such a way that the people, whatever training we are going to organize, speaks to the people's needs and is relevant to their needs at that particular time. And we also have to get the budget right and engaging the budget right is where we do plan for this event in consultation with the farmers who are the beneficiaries of whatever our trainings we are trying to work on or to come up with or to communicate to the farmers. I'll now pass it on to Maria. Thank you so much. Thank you, Axon. That was fantastic. I really appreciate the great presentation. And all of you have heard many speakers today speak about very different aspects of making sure that women can come to trainings to ensure that you are training the right people, even if it is youth or even if it is men or disadvantaged populations. Um, I wanted to open this time up for questions right now to see if you as participants, you had questions. And most importantly, we um, acknowledge that you are experts in your own right. We do not stand here as experts giving you tips on what to do. Um, but if we see ourselves as an equal footing and sharing our, our own learning uh, and experiences from trainings or even trainings that we have attended, not just facilitated, I wanted to ask this question to the audience. What sort of barriers have you noticed um, in getting women to attend to your trainings? Or if you have not facilitated training, if you've just attended trainings, have you noticed that women could not make it? Or if you are a woman yourself, what has kept you from attending a specific training event? So please take a couple of seconds to uh, jot down some thoughts in the chat box. We will read them out aloud. And meanwhile, I am going to ask um, Axon actually the same question in terms of um, how he has addressed these barriers. Axon comes to us from the Ministry of Agriculture in Zambia, and it's uh, our pleasure to host him here at the University of Illinois for this summer. But he has had a lot of experience um, in hosting these field days and field events. And Axon, I'm just going to throw this question out to you as the audience answers this question as well. What sort of barriers have you specifically noticed in getting women to come to your extension training events and how have you addressed them? Um, thank you so much, Maria, for that uh, question. Well, they are, the barriers are so numerous, but times are changing and uh, people are becoming much more aware of what needs to be done to rectify the situation, to give uh, women a voice. And some of the barriers, um, social barriers, when it comes to gender roles and uh, when it comes to sex roles, you find that some of the gender roles that have been ascribed uh, societal roles that have been ascribed pertaining to either you are male or female tend to sort of come in also as gender barriers. An example is where a woman needs to attend, that's one of the gender roles is that a woman needs to attend to the household needs as regards food preparation, as regards making sure that the children are clean, as regards making sure that the husband is provided for. That's sort of a society role that has been ascribed on the women for. And so you find that by so doing, you have more men who have free time at their disposal to come for these events when a woman is busy attending to the household needs. And we have worked around this by making sure that some of our events, especially most of our events, we encourage uh, female and male participation by saying people should come as couples and should be, make, and the men should make sure that the women have their voice to be heard in, that, in those, occasion, in the, in those uh, meetings or in those trainings. So they come as, as couples. And another aspect that we've done is where we've encouraged the formation of uh, women-only uh, cooperatives, where the women come together to form their own farmer groups and cooperatives so as to not have the male dominance over them, their affairs. And that seems to be working out. And so we have cooperatives where we have male and female, and we have cooperatives where we have female only, and we have cooperatives where we have uh, the male only. 
But we've seen that a lot is being done and a lot gets to be covered and a lot gets to be adopted when we have women-only cooperatives as compared to male-only cooperatives because of the, attach, the importance that women attach, seem to attach to their operations because they know that ultimately it has to benefit the whole household that they're taking care of. So all these barriers are sort of inherent and they're there, but slowly but sure, people are coming to the realization that each one has a role to play. Thank you. Thank you, Axon. That was great. And I'm also seeing really good responses from the participants here. Uh, we have Shahana saying um, women's timing uh, location. If it's too far, women cannot travel as they're not allowed to travel and travel costs. Um, Caroline is mentioning that um, that she, in response, we encourage both husbands and wives to attend trainings. Um, we see Sarkal saying some of the barriers that they face is the burden of women face is burden of family work, traditional societal beliefs, poor access to ICT. And we've also had some um, folks talk about timing is very important. Um, I believe it's Johanna who says that I set the time after breakfast and end by noon so that people can go to their house and take care of household tasks like cooking and or hold trainings after 3 p.m. when they're completely free and also not holding trainings during harvesting season, which is very important. We also have um, Ashley mentioning that the biggest issue in the past has been women can't leave home for multiple days, which is very true to make it to a five day training. So we should look into half day um, over a week or a longer period or um, or cater to a, a, another sort of training format that caters to women's time constraints. Shahan has also mentioned that families expect women to be paid to attend the mm -hmm. training. So you're right, there are so many barriers that um, we all face when we're trying to get women into these training events. And as we can see that um, each of you in your respective training events, you have tried different approaches that have worked or you keep learning about what doesn't work and you're making steps in the right, pro, uh, in the right direction. Um, we also have one more comment from Diana, uh, where she says, in my country, women need to go shopping and cook in the morning. Thus, if the training takes the whole morning, it's difficult for them to join. So if I might just say from all the comments that we're getting and from what even Axon said, Timing is so critical to ensure that women can make it to your trainings, um, not having it in the mornings or having it later in the afternoons or not having it during harvest time. So thank you all for the comments. Please keep them coming. I'm not going to pass a question on to Andrea. So Andrea, have you had any specific experience in terms of having women only groups or mixed groups? What do you think is the best in at least in your experience of fostering best interactions? Um, so I think it depends on the country or culture you're talking with, because there may be particular religious or other barriers to it. And so you have to, in, in, some, in some places, there's going to be a more clear pro and con to mixed versus uh, single gender groups. And the other is really related to the content. Um, so let me give you an example, though. So let's say we talk about nutrition, and we're going to do training on improved cooking methods. It's very easy to fall into our stereotypes and say, well, in this country, it's practically only the women who are responsible for all the meals, so let's do the training just for the women. So yes, we'll have a women-only training. Makes a lot of sense. Well, maybe yes on the surface, but what you're really ultimately trying to do with any training, it's about increasing the level of knowledge about improving skills and changing attitudes. And um, let's say you, you're encouraging the use of less sugar in a certain dish. Well, even if you are talking about a culture where it is indeed the women who make all the decisions around what to cook and how to cook, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> they, can, they can really have some challenges back home if the dish tastes uh, differently. So here you talk about something where maybe the women are in charge, but you want to, men to also embrace and understand why this change may be, may be in their interest. So it's just an example of how 
it's very simple to come to a quick conclusion and say, oh, I'm just going to invite the women to the cooking demonstration. But you actually need to have men involved in one way or another. The other is we're not just, we shouldn't just think about the event itself, but how it's perceived in the community or the circle that our trainees belong to. I know in, in some countries where there's a lot of um, um, limitations on women's mobility, um, and a lot is really about protecting her reputation as a member of society, that uh, there is a lot of mistrust if you only invite women to a certain event. So in, in planning the event, it's a lot about really understanding the cultural or societal context and how that will be received and getting allies on board. If um, the decision makers, the religious leaders in the community, the men um, are very supportive of what you're trying to do with an event where it may make sense to have only women, um, but they would still have to come on board and being um, okay with that idea, basically, and hopefully supportive. So there's no, no straightforward answer. It's, it's about the content, it's about the context, and it's about not making assumptions, but testing those assumptions and getting people on board, thinking through, talking it through with um, stakeholders, what makes the most sense for this type of content in this type of context. Thanks, Andrea. That was really good in terms of not making assumptions, but testing assumptions. Um, I just have one last question for Tim, but before we go into that question, I wanted to throw another question out of the audience. Um, in your experience, how have you dealt with literacy barriers? As we all know, in most of our training events, women tend to be lower literate um, in relative, relatively to men. And I wanted to ask, um, especially when it comes to technical trainings, how have you dealt with it? I also see some comments uh, on um, uh, single groups are better, but mixed groups are also good. So to cross check the gender issues within the family, that's a great point, Johanna, thank you. But um, at, like I just mentioned, um, please, please um, if you can think about how have you addressed literacy concerns, uh, especially with lower literacy in women, uh, to address technical trainings? Uh, if you have any thoughts or approaches or great things that you have seen, please do share them on the chat box. And meanwhile, I'm going to pass the same question on to Tim. So Tim, in your experience with ASMC, how have um, you ensured that trainings are, um, um, trainings are much more women friendly, especially when women have lower literacy levels than men? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think the first one that really jumps out to my mind and sticks with me is by, by making trainings hands-on and, and making them more demonstrations than maybe uh, a classroom setting where you're just reading off information or, or speaking information. Um, I see Axon mentioned using the local language during trainings. That's a, that's a great point. Um, uh, using the local language, making sure that they're able to understand. And if it, the national language isn't the local language, making sure that you do have a translator for that local, local dialect. Um, but the, the ASMC strategy that we've done this far is really a lot of hands-on learning. So if we do implement a new technology, it's in the field, in the community, and they're getting a chance to work with it and practice with it. Um, see, see how it works, ask questions, really have this, this kind of hands-on, one-on-one feel um, to facilitate maybe the lower literacy rates and, and really make uh, learn by seeing and learn by doing as opposed to learn by listening or reading. Um, is our approach. That's a great point. Thank you, Tim. Um, learning by doing by more experiential learning, as they call it, as instead of sitting in a classroom or looking at um, PowerPoints, um, this is more experiential. I wanted to, again, ask audience, um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. We will continue to answering the questions. But since we are running short on time, I wanted to um, close this webinar today and encourage you to attend the final, um, the final webinar session, which will be on May 25th at 8 a.m. CST on great facilitation. And we will be specifically looking at three tips on 
creating a supportive community, getting great facilitators, and what to do after the training. So thank you very much for every single person who attended. Uh, feel free to continue the conversations in the chat box. Um, we are hoping to continue the conversations. And yes, you will receive the resources, including the presentation from this week and the previous week um, in the email today that we sent out to you today. Thank you very much. And we hope you have a good day, good afternoon, or good evening. Thank you. Uh, ju just a quick reminder, everybody, to please, please, please join on Friday as well. And please send this out to your networks. Um, if anybody can benefit from this training, and I, and I believe many can, please encourage them to come attend and, and join the webinar. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the time today and hope to see you again this Friday.